The Economist, I do think, likes to uh, offer praise, and I hope you agree with me here, Secretary, uh, pra offer praise where praise is due. And I, I do think, I believe our coverage of the Philippines uh, since uh, the Aquino government came uh, to office has, I think, has reflected uh, a generally positive outlook for the Philippines. Uh, I, I think I, the way I would put it is that the, there's been a, 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 a professionalization of the government in a way which I think perhaps wasn't there in the previous government. And uh, I have to say that I think the um, secretary has played an important role in that, uh, in that process. And uh, let me just say, uh, as a chorology, that just how delighted we are here, everybody, to have you with us. And thank you very much for taking um, time out of your very uh, busy schedule um, to, to come uh, to talk to us today. Um, I just wanted to start off, if I could, Secretary, just by uh, kind of reflecting back a little bit um, on, you know, obviously the Philippines is no stranger to disasters. Um, we have uh, typhoons on a regular basis. We have uh, volcanic eruptions. There are all sorts of uh, things that, uh, disasters that happen in the Philippines. But uh, I think there is a very strong sense that Haiyan, or rather Yolanda as it's known in the Philippines, the, the typhoon that happened in November last year was really very, very different in scale from what happened in many of the other disasters. And that I wonder if you could just lead us back through the way in which that happened as the finance secretary, the way in which that happened and how it unfolded and how you responded to that as it unfolded. Because I think it would be good to set the scene for those that are not really uh, aware of it uh, and how you responded, particularly from the point of view of the finance ministry as well, how you actually put things together. Well, first, uh, I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Uh, this is a topic that's uh, very close to my heart because, uh, as you know, the Philippines is among the top uh, three, top five uh, uh, countries most vulnerable to uh, natural calamities. In fact, as we speak, uh, we're waiting for another typhoon to hit uh, landfall, that landfall that they say uh, may be as strong as, uh, uh, potentially, as uh, uh, Haiyan, hopefully not. No? But um, Haiyan, opened our eyes to, um, at least from my sta where I sit, some of the fiscal vulnerabilities at different levels. No? Uh, the first it is at the lowest level, the people, the grassroots. No? Uh, as you know, the nature of the storm was uh, so strong that uh, a lot of people uh, not only lost their houses, uh, they lost their livelihood. And uh, a lot of them were not insured. In fact, most of them were not insured. And uh, they didn't have a way to get back up. And the only uh, entity uh, that they could go to would be the government or agencies such as uh, our friends, uh, the multilaterals, and the other NGOs. No? So that's the first uh, thing that uh, we realized, that uh, if we are to win our fight against poverty, which is a major goal of the Aquino administration, I think we need to put in some mechanism that would uh, uh, help people get uh, survive financially the effect of natural calamities. Because those that are near poor, once they're hit with this, will slide back down and it's harder to get them back up. That's the first realization. The second are the local government units uh, uh, in the affected areas. No? So uh, they're the unit that's supposed to respond. They're the unit that's supposed to uh, take care of the needs of their local uh, community. But they lost everything. They lost their own organization. Uh, their own people were victims themselves. They lost their taxpayer base because uh, most of the businesses were gone. So they didn't have any resources. Again, similar situation to, to uh, the grassroots. They have nowhere to turn but um, the national uh, uh, government. Then I reflected on us, the national government. Uh, one of the successes of the Aquino administration is uh, to bring the Philippines to a path of fiscal sustainability. But this was one aspect that uh, we never thought of before, before uh, you know, we hit, were hit by Ayan. So we started thinking uh, hard, how can we now uh, make sure that if uh, this is going to be the new normal, that we're going to create uh, mechanisms, structures, uh, revenue uh, flows that would allow us to better deal uh, financially uh, with uh, 
with uh, events like this. No? Then at the higher level, which is on the global basis, I'll deal with that uh, uh, later. No? So uh, we're still uh, coping with a lot of the uh, issues right now. No? But on the lowest level, we've been uh, working with uh, uh, various organizations. Uh, one of them is KFW that, uh, as you know, they um, have loans to the Philippines. One of the things they did was to uh, w lower or waive the interest on some of our loans, which created a fund for us that uh, we're now using uh, as a microfinance fund to the affected uh, entrepreneurs, uh, micro entrepreneurs in the area. But uh, instead of lending them normally at micro uh, funding rates of um, around 20%. We're lending them at subsidized levels. No? Uh, we're looking at 6%. No? We can actually lend lower, except that we thought of putting in an insurance component uh, to this loan so that uh, if a typhoon of a certain magnitude hits the area again, the loan would then be extinguished. So at least it's not burdened with a liability. No? Uh, but this is just uh, one uh, uh, aspect uh, of it. Uh, we're working with uh, the with, uh, government service insurance system to see how we can offer a more comprehensive uh, micro insurance uh, uh, product that would be affordable, uh, but not only affordable, it would, not, it would not be optional. That it is something when they do something or they buy something, it's automatic, it's built into the pricing. Because if you make it optional, the tendency of people who are in need would be to focus on the immediate needs, which is not an insurance, which is something else. That's why if we can, uh, we're working on how to create products uh, uh, like that. No? Then on the local government uh, level, we have, you know, the Philippines is not as big as other countries, but it's bigger than Singapore. No? So we have, uh, <laughs> We have uh, many local government units. There were those that were not hit, but each one has a calamity fund. So we have, uh, we're drafting a law that would uh, uh, allow them to share pool resources so that those that are not hit can then lend their resources to those that are hit. And then again, working with the government service insurance system, see how we can do some reinsurance on the pooling of the uh, interest. Then finally, at the national level, uh, one of the things that uh, Contoro, JICA, and uh, ADB, and the others uh, have uh, shared with us is that uh, there is uh, nothing better than uh, uh, planning uh, for uh, better resiliency. No? Uh, you, you say uh, it's a better use of money. But uh, a country, again, that has so much needs, no? Uh, would prefer to deal with uh, the more current needs. No? So um, I have a proposal that uh, I'm still trying to sell to the con Congress and to our own administration of creating a climate resiliency fund. It will be a special levy that, would on, that will be uh, with the objective of uh, creating a fund that I can then leverage so that we can, one, uh, move people out of uh, vulnerable areas because uh, uh, in Metro Manila alone, there are over 150,000 families that we think are in vulnerable areas. So, so that's the first thing, move them out. We know where they are, the, the vulnerable areas, that's one. Secondly, help us improve uh, public uh, buildings. In Japan, uh, when there's an emergency, they're told to go to public buildings. But again, with the experience of Haiyan, our public buildings were destroyed, and they were in the wrong location. For example, the Coliseum that uh, was normally the place people went, was very vulnerable to storm uh, uh, surge. But it cost money to uh, move them, move this. Uh, so that the fund would be used for that. Third would be helping us deal with, uh, with uh, extremes. No? For example, this time of the year, uh, we normally don't get typhoons, no? but now it's still typhoon season. Mm. And when you're in Manila, in the past, when we were younger, uh, it was cooler. Now it's a bit humid and uh, warm, and you get rains uh, all the time. So the weather is out of uh, whack, as they uh, uh, say. And therefore, I think uh, uh, the debate uh, should no longer be there. Uh, uh, I think uh, we should err in favor of uh, planet Earth, in favor of conservatism. 
uh, that uh, you know um, uh, the, this might be the new normal, and therefore uh, we should prepare for it. And more than prepare for it, I think uh, we should look at how we measure economic performance and financial performance so that the effect on environment of economic activity and business activity is automatically measured. Uh, because if you don't, you know, one of the things I learned in the private sector is that things you don't measure don't get done. And if you don't measure it and it's not built into the way we do things, I think we'll be talking and talking in seminars like this for a long time because the measures don't give us the incentive to actually uh, work on these things. Well, let's come back to the measuring of this uh, yeah. a little bit later because that's, that's an important element of it. But yeah. what, what you seem to be saying is that in, in a very important way, uh, Yolanda has catalyzed a yeah. new thinking in the Philippines. And I, I mean, this was part of a discussion that we were having earlier, the extent to which natural disasters of this scale prompt fundamental structural changes of attitude of, uh, of the way in which things are done. Um, I mean, it, it, in some ways, it's a pity that that's the case, but there's also a linking thought, and that is, yes, uh, it's necessary to have that change of mind, but how do you then sort of build in, if there are just broader stresses to the uh, resilience framework and stresses that come from healthcare, from all sorts of different things in the Philippines, um, how do you then sort of address those if it took a real catastrophe to get you to uh, the point of, of, of really acting uh, around some of these things? Well, it's me, uh, the finance secretary, uh, uh, talking right now. Uh, as uh, If there's another finance secretary here, uh, I'm sure he'll tell you that uh, it's a lonely job, you know. Uh, people don't like to talk about taxes. People don't like to talk about uh, uh, raising taxes. People uh, don't like to see you, no, <laughs> unless there is a fiscal uh, uh, crisis. So long as the money is coming in, they're happy, you know. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, um, uh, for me, no, uh, I hope that everyone uh, um, uh, with high end, no, uh, suddenly um, woke up from this. Yeah. Has this made, I mean, it's obviously made you think very differently about resilience itself, hasn't it? I mean, this whole process has brought you to a different point. Yeah. Um, you're there sitting in the central position of managing the fiscal situation of the country. Yeah. You have to make choices about what yeah. spending is done. Yeah. So it's obviously clearly made you think differently, hasn't it? Yes. Uh, and uh, the, the challenge now for me is to try and build the political support mm. uh, in Congress, because they have the power of the purse, to uh, support this and, of course, uh, build it within the br our branch of government, the executive. And right now, we're in a process where we're uh, engaged in discussion on this issue. But uh, if uh, high end didn't happen, I wouldn't even be able to get to first base. Mm. Right? So that's why uh, the, the silver lining and uh, to high end, of course, that was a horrible um, natural calamity, is that uh, people now are open mm. to the fact that this may be the new normal, and therefore, we have to do something about it. For example, our uh, public works uh, department is talking about building back better. Mm. Our, um, our um, uh, DSWD, the Social Welfare Department, uh, is trying to rethink the way they uh, preposition their goods and the way they train people to react to uh, calamity. So everyone, I think, uh, is uh, starting to uh, try and adjust the way they do things. Mm. Uh, to make sure that if this thing happens again, then uh, we'll have a better uh, job of uh, of uh, surviving it or uh, you know recovering uh, uh, from it. But from a financial standpoint, um, I think because all everything starts from resources. Without resources, there is no country. You know? The ability to generate resources at the heart of uh, uh, the, 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 the responsibility of uh, countries. If not, it, it won't be able to generate services. So that's why I've been looking at this carefully. I've been talking to the World Bank. For example, we're talking about uh, issuing bonds uh, with an insurance component together with another country in the other side of the globe. So that then we can uh, better package, it be becomes more feasible, and uh, the reinsurance rates and the, the, the pricing would be better given that there are non-correlated risks. No? So now we're looking at these things and uh, uh, in, uh, you know, we're at uh, relatively advanced uh, discussions of uh, 
uh, doing this. Yeah. Can I just come back to your point about <clears throat> needing to sell this to Congress? Yeah. Needing to sell it. I don't know whether you sell it, have to sell it to the president as well. But um, the idea that you know, I mean, it looks fairly self-evident to me that this is a necessary process. Yeah. But um, what? What is the economic case that you have to make essentially to, to Congress and to people that need to be persuaded um, of the need to do, need to think more resiliently and need to the, invest in it? The economic case would really have to be linked to our primary goal, which is to improve our people's lives, to uh, eliminate as many people as we can, if not all, out of poverty. And um, I think now we have a realization that uh, um, the near poor, which is a big portion of our population, mm -hmm. can... Uh, slide back up, uh, back down uh, with events like this. And if we don't have mechanisms uh, to bring them back up, then we will never be able to get to our ultimate goal, which is uh, creating a Philippines that's uh, free of uh, uh, poverty. And uh, the president's uh, uh, a big proponent of uh, uh, investing in our uh, people. And that's why when selling this, you cannot just sell it as a standalone thing. It has to be looked at uh, as a complete uh, a part of a whole, no? as a way to get to uh, the ultimate goals of uh, uh, government, not for resiliency's sake, but for making sure that uh, we are able to uh, uh, give people the ability to actualize their potentials. And I think that's how it's uh, being sold right now. I mean, what you're sort of suggesting too is that there's a, kind of, there's a dividend at the end of it in a way. I mean, in, in one way, you're suggesting that, that that comes through a greater level of actualization of incomes and improvement in people's lives. But is there, a, is there a broader, do you think in terms of having a resilience dividend? It's been part of the discussion today that, you know, if you invest now um, in problems that are going to occur later, you actually create opportunities um, to, uh, you know, for business and for, for income growth and so on and so forth. Is that, is that something that is behind some of the thinking that you're... Well, uh, for me, the biggest resilience uh, dividend is that uh, we, uh, we will be able to uh, uh, realize our demographic dividend. As you know, the Philippines is the youngest country in Asia, average age of 23. Uh, we're about 100 million people, and if we are not able to invest in them, make sure that they have the skills, make sure that they uh, are healthy enough to become productive participants, not only in our economy, but in an integrated ASEAN, uh, then uh, we won't be able to realize it. And uh, if uh, typhoons keep hitting them, uh, then uh, you know our job of uh, making sure that they're ready to participate would become uh, harder. That is the ultimate uh, resilience uh, uh, dividend for us. The second, uh, of course, is uh, uh, our own uh, uh, businesses. No? Make sure that um, they're competitive because uh, if they're located in the Philippines and they get, get hit all the time, then they'll be competing at a handicap vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, uh, our neighbors. And as we open up our economy to more competition, uh, which is really inevitable, then I think that's the other uh, uh, dividend. But, you know, I really look at resilience as a palliative. I really believe that uh, we have to be more serious about uh, addressing the root cause of uh, climate change, which is really uh, uh, emissions. And I'm not a scientist, no? but with what I'm seeing, uh, you know, I was just talking to a German business group uh, over lunch. They were saying uh, last winter in Germany, was quite warm. They had days where the temperature was 80 degrees. And right now in Germany, they still don't have snow. I haven't been there but, uh, lately, but uh, they're saying that. No? So you can see that the uh, change is there. I read an article just today that uh, 2014, so far the first 10 months of the year, is the hottest ever since 1880, according to the US uh, NOAA. And they're, it's shaping up to be the hottest year uh, of uh, so far uh, in, in, in history. So um, I think that is the ultimate goal. Uh, resiliency is a palliative to make sure that we're even better able to deal with the challenges. But how do we now make sure that our, our actions will not lead to more of these uh, uh, problems? Because we have to accept it. Uh, I think I read it in an economist. Uh, um, article. That's a problem with reading The Economist, you know, a lot of ideas uh, <laughs> enter your mind. They're saying that because of uh, petroleum, the global population has been artificially increased from its 
constant labor for a long time of about 1.9 billion to where it is now. So uh, clearly, we've uh, been addicted uh, to this way of life that has a repercussion. And we have to find a way to get to another uh, level uh, where we don't have to lose those uh, 7 billion that uh, exist, but at the same time doesn't have the impact that it has uh, on the globe. And I really believe we should start at the basics, which is change our accounting model, change our economic model. Imagine a mining company. When they do their financial statements, there is no cost to planet Earth or close to the uh, environment. So, um, it just amortizes its own cost of digging the, the mine. But it doesn't capture the cost that it has on all of us. I'm trying to recall that uh, piece that you mentioned about the oil companies and uh, the fossil fuels. It's an fuels, article I, that I read somewhere. That's a problem with the internet. I wonder if there are any oil companies here that might be uh, worried about yeah. that. Um, I, I mean, you, you spoke about actions on the ground and the need for improving the way in which you, uh, yeah. you understand uh -huh. the vulnerabilities that you uh -huh. have, I think, if I'm yeah. just interpreting you right. I mean, how, how are you going to further develop the capacities that you clearly need in the Philippines to understand the vulnerabilities, the very significant vulnerabilities uh, that are there? We had an interesting example from somebody from India today uh, who was talking to me about the way in which the Indian government is investing in institutions, in particularly academic institutions, to allow the development and the building of capacity um, for urbanization and uh, through that resilience. Um, at the moment, they don't have any of those capacities. H how, how are you going to make an assessment of the vulnerabilities, the considerable vulnerabilities that you have? And are you thinking of investing in a broader sense in well, we've started to actually. Uh, for example, our Department of Science and Technology, uh, based on instruction from the president, has uh, engaged uh, uh, risk mapping uh, experts, and they actually uh, took uh, uh, looked at the database, and they have a map of the Philippines uh, with probabilities of uh, vulner vulnerabilities depending on strength of typhoon, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And uh, if you look uh, at the, our map, it's mostly red on our coast along our coast, and therefore, uh, questions such as the location of the airport in Tacloban, which is in a very uh, vulnerable uh, area based on that uh, risk mapping. Do you uh, just keep it there and just put up uh, sea walls, or do you relocate them? That discussion is going on as a result of uh, uh, this. Uh, to uh, talking about uh, building new settlements, uh, we're building houses away from what we call red zones. No? And we're not supposed to su supporting those who are uh, relocating in vulnerable uh, areas. So we have an information campaign where we tell people, look, you are in a vulnerable uh, area. So I think that's the first part, uh, uh, educating people that uh, uh, not, uh, not uh, everything in, uh, in a village or in a city is uh, uh, equally uh, uh, situated no? uh, from a, ri a risk uh, standpoint. It may be ideal for jobs, no? but it's not ideal for uh, when there's a uh, typhoon. I think that's the first step. Uh, secondly, I think we have to incorporate it in our investment plan. No? So uh, our National Economic Development Authority, using some of these inputs, are now revisiting our uh, investment plans and then prioritizing uh, which ones now do we have to uh, do uh, uh, first. No? Uh, third, uh, we're looking at um, our own codes, building codes, our own uh, policies. No? So there is a revisit of the whole uh, uh, thing, but I think the most important thing is the education of everyone involved. That comes to a, a, another question around uh, regul regulatory certainty in around some of these issues. It seems to me that that's fundamental. Land use planning, yeah. um, incentives around land use planning, proper regulations or proper regulations, clear regulations around uh, around those issues. And you could extend that uh, into other areas as well. I mean, for example, the insurance sector, there was a comment, set of comments today about um, the extent to which insurance companies wish to get involved in these processes, but not prepared to unless there's greater levels of regulatory certainty. Are these, are these issues that you see as being a 
fundamentally part of that holistic view of creating resilience? Do you uh, well, um, even without these issues, uh, regulatory certainty is a very major factor in in uh, attracting FDIs. No? So we've been uh, dealing with this. We've, we've been trying to uh, institutionalize uh, true laws and true uh, uh, our own uh, institutions, the right policies to be able to attract uh, uh, investments. It's always a challenge in a democratic uh, uh, system to have uh, uh, policy uh, continuity. Mm -hmm. uh, in our case, we have a presidency that's one term, six years. So we're good for that six years, but do we get assurance that what we started will be continued by the uh, one who uh, who um, uh, start uh, who, who takes over? No? Those are the challenges, and that's why I envy uh, sometimes parliamentary systems such as in Singapore, where you have continuity of uh, party uh, uh, rule, uh, and they've taken advantage of it with uh, uh, making sure that they're able to implement long-term uh, uh, projects where the benefits is not very clear uh, in the near term but very important in the long term. For example, their water supply. I mean, uh, that uh, is a very long-term project, but look, they're now uh, not vulnerable uh, anymore. So that is the challenge. How do you now uh, come up with this type of projects uh, under a political system where you only have six years for the present? In the local government, which is important in implementing this, mind you, in the Philippines, it's three years. So three years, every three years, they go through an election. And uh, they can only be elected twice also, so a total of uh, uh, six years. In Japan, we were talking about it earlier, uh, they keep changing governments, but they have bureaucrat uh, bureaucratic uh, continuity. Their bureaucracy is very strong, that it's able to continue uh, uh, policies. That's something that we need to address as well. Can I just want to um, see if there are thoughts and comments and particularly questions for Secretary Purisima um, from the floor. Any, any thoughts and questions? Down here. Anna. Hi. Um, my name is Anna Brown. I'm with the Rockefeller Foundation based in our Asia office. And thank you so much for your remarks. It's really um, great to hear some tangible ideas on the table. I was curious, um, you've talked a little bit about relocation. And land use is such a big issue in cities, um, given, and, and it's so contentious. And I, I was curious if you had any examples or ideas about particular instruments or mechanisms um, or, or incentives that might help um, address questions of, of relocation, in particular thinking about the business and industry sector, um, where they're located in vulnerable areas or, or municipal services like airports, which you, you, you mentioned. Um, obviously interested also in, in um, relocation of poorer populations, but I'm curious, just given the audience, um, more on the business side of things. Yeah, uh, the challenge with relocation, uh, first with people, is that uh, they will be uh, further away from their livelihood. That's uh, the normal uh, uh, challenge. Or uh, their, their children will be further away from the schools. So one, one I think, um, insight that we've uh, learned is that if you relocate, you should relocate uh, completely. Uh, so even if you just built a school, you, you create new schools, uh, you build new schools in the relocation side. Uh, two, you encourage businesses to, to also relocate there, but that's easier said than uh, uh, done. Because without a job, without day-to-day -day opportunities to uh, survive, they'd rather take the risk in the uh, 20, 30 days that they're vulnerable so that they can leave uh, 11 months of the uh, year. That's a trade-off uh, for uh, people. The other is that the safer grounds are um, normally what we reserve for uh, um, our forest. No? So that is the other question. Do you release these areas uh, and uh, uh, you know, destroy whatever uh, forest left uh, uh, we have? Because we're talking of island uh, ecosystems uh, here that's really not large uh, 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 bodies of land, no? but uh, really uh, you know, small islands. Uh, you know, we have 7,000 of this. No? So um, that's, uh, I think, one of the things that uh, is uh, very important. You have to be decisive. No? And then uh, you have to make sure that um, if they, they move there, they have everything that they, can, that they will need uh, to be able to live on a day-to-day -day, 
uh, basis. One further problem that arises from what you've just been saying there, of course, is this question of deforestation. You're talking yeah. about, yeah, I mean, it seems to me that there is a need to look in a very integrated way at some of the problems that yeah. exist. I mean, it might be a typhoon coming in from the sea, but at the same time, the, the slopes yeah. of the hills are denuded yeah. quite often. So yeah. how, from a planning point of view, how, do you, how, how would you approach, how, how are you approaching that? Unfortunately, we're not planning from a clean sheet of paper here. That's why we're, we're <laughs> planning from a very uh, uh, an, an, um, imperfect uh, uh, sheet of uh, paper. So one of the things that uh, the, our Environment and Natural Resources Department is talking is about uh, uh, rebuilding the mangrove uh, uh, shoreline. So they're now talking about uh, uh, making sure that uh, we uh, rehabilitate that, uh, uh, that forest. And uh, hopefully that can compensate for whatever we cut uh, uh, up there, and in the meantime give you more uh, buffer uh, for storm surges uh, uh, in the future. No? Uh, and then uh, we we're talking really of uh, uh, teaching people new ways of uh, new, new livelihood also, because uh, uh, in some you know they, they cut the forest and you know burn it, uh, slash and burn. Uh, uh, technology again, educating people, giving them alternative uh, uh, li livelihood. The silver lining, I'll, I'll share with you, uh, livelihood silver lining in the case of Haiyan. The area that was hit was uh, a coconut dependent economy. Uh, coconut, as you know, um, you know, it takes uh, five years to grow before it uh, bears fruit, no? and then it bears fruit for a long, long time. Uh, so most of the trees are gone now. So uh, we cannot plant uh, because it will take five years. So at least this gives us the opportunity to shift the economy of this area into cash crops, into uh, uh, crops that would give them better uh, livelihood with more, more active uh, uh, involvement. So um, there's always a silver lining, but you have to uh, uh, make, make it happen. Other thoughts and questions down there, please, yes, if you just say your name. And your organization. Hello, hello. Yeah, I'm Constantina Karedi from Athens. I'm advisor to the mayor, and I was responsible for the resilience team application for for the city of Athens. And actually, my comment is about the clean sheet that you just said that we don't operate in clean sheet. And I wanted to say that from a previous discussion. So basically, my question is, how do you? integrate, for example, the resilience policy, the resilience economic policy into the departments, into the employees, the permanent public sector employees. Because I see that, I see this problem in Greece, in Athens, very often that the political staff comes in and then they don't necessarily cooperate with them. Permanent employees have been there for decades maybe, or the younger ones, they don't get the opportunities. There's not a link between, let's say, the innovation that comes from abroad, the new ideas, the new thoughts, the um, priorities of a, of a political um, personnel with the everyday public sector workers. And I find that unless somehow we combine this, we cannot be on the road to, the, to resilience, especially after, after we go. Thank you very much. You don't just have One Congress to deal with, you have the civil service to deal with, of course. One of the things that uh, President Aquino introduced uh, to uh, uh, our government is uh, what they call the performance-based budget. So uh, every year you uh, propose a budget for your department or whatever unit you're part of. Um, before, you know, they just ask for how much you need. Now, uh, for when you ask for money, uh, you agree on uh, performance measures that uh, you'll be held accountable to. Uh, by the president and uh, uh, ultimately uh, Congress. So uh, one of those would be uh, for the relevant uh, uh, ministries, uh, they put uh, how many people have you moved out of uh, the danger zones? No? How many uh, people have you trained uh, uh, to uh, in cash crops instead of uh, uh, coconut? So that's now part of, uh, of their performance uh, uh, measures. And that's what I mean by making sure that we measure uh, this because what you don't measure really doesn't get uh, uh, accomplished. So uh, that's one of the things that we hope can make a difference. Any other thoughts uh, or questions from the floor? No, we are just down here.
before you had Haiyan and the that typhoon and that specific experience, um, if there are key things that have really changed because of that, be useful to know. I think it's a tip, uh, it's part of human nature. No, it, uh, things that you haven't experienced, uh, you tend to uh, uh, downplay. No, and. Uh, uh, underestimate, and um, I think uh, this uh, opened our eyes, uh, especially those that lived through it. I just saw it on TV, just like you guys, because I was in uh, uh, Manila, but I saw it with my own eyes afterwards, and uh, I've never seen anything like that, and uh, that really uh, shocked us. So I think there's, uh, normally when you're shocked, then you're made to uh, you know revisit all your assumptions. So uh, without that. Uh, I don't think you can get me to spend uh, as much time I'm trying, uh, spending now on things that I would have thought is likely to happen. I would uh, be more focused on the day-to-day -day needs of the uh, economy. In fact, that's a challenge now. No? Uh, people still think of this as uh, um, uh, something that they can uh, uh, win through odds. No? Uh, but unfortunately, uh, with what we saw with Haiyan, um, uh, everyone is equally affected, uh, and um, it's going to be more often than that. Uh, the three strongest typhoons in Philippine history happened the last three years. So, well, with that uh, very candid admission, um, I I think we uh, uh, would like to draw. I'd like to draw this to a close. Please uh, do join me in thanking um, Secretary Paul. Thank you. Thank you.